chapter one. I went to work when I was just out of grammar school. I got a job as quotation board boy in a stockbroker's office. I was quick at figures. At school, I did three years of arithmetic and one. I was particularly good at mental arithmetic. As quotation board boy, I posted the numbers on the big board in the customers' room. One of the customers usually sat by the ticker and called out the prices. They couldn't come too fast for me. I've always remembered numbers. No trouble at all. There were plenty of other employees in that office. Of course, I made friends with the other fellows, but the work I did, if the market was active, kept me too busy from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. to let me do much talking. I don't care for it anyhow during business hours, but a busy market did not keep me from thinking about the work. Those quotations did not represent prices of stocks to me. So many dollars per share. They were numbers. Of course, they meant something. They were always changing. It was all I had to be interested in. The changes. Why did they change? I didn't know. I didn't care. I didn't think about that. I simply saw that they changed. That was all I had to think about. Five hours every day and two on Saturdays. That they were always changing. That is how I first came to be interested in the behavior of prices. I had a very good memory for figures. I can remember in detail how the prices had acted on the previous day, just before they went up or down. My fondness for mental arithmetic came in very handy. I noticed that in advances as well as declines, stock prices were apt to show certain habits, so to speak. There was no end of parallel cases, and these made precedents to guide me. I was only 14, but after I had taken hundreds of observations in my mind, I found myself testing their accuracy, comparing the behavior of stocks today with other days. It was not long before I was anticipating movements in prices. My only guide, as I say, was their past performances. I carried the dope sheets in my mind. I looked for stock prices to run on form. I had clocked them. You know what I mean? You can spot, for instance, where the buying is only a trifle better than the selling. A battle goes on in the stock market, and the tape is your telescope. You can depend upon it seven out of ten cases. Another lesson I learned early is that there is nothing new in Wall Street. There can't be, because speculation is as old as the hills. Whatever happens in the stock market today has happened before and will happen again. I've never forgotten that. I suppose I really managed to remember when and how it happened. The fact that I remember that way is my way of capitalizing experience. I got so interested in my game and so anxious to anticipate advances and declines in all the active stocks that I got a little book. I put down my observations in it. It was not a record of imaginary transactions, such as so many people keep merely to make or lose millions of dollars. Without getting the swelled head or going to the poorhouse, it was rather a sort of record of my hits and misses. And next to the determination of probable movements, I was most interested in verifying whether I had observed accurately. In other words, whether I was right. Saying that after studying every fluctuation of the day in an active stock, I would conclude that it was behaving as it always did before it broke eight or ten points. Well, I would jot down the stock and the price on Monday, and remembering past performances, I would write down what it ought to do on Tuesday and Wednesday. Later, I would check up with actual transcriptions from the tape. That is how I first came to take an interest in the message of the tape. The fluctuations were, from the first, associated in my mind with upward or downward movements. Of course, there is always a reason for fluctuations. But the tape does not concern itself with the why and wherefore. It doesn't go into explanations. I didn't ask the tape why when I was 14, and I don't ask it today at 40. The reason for what a certain stock does today may not be known for two or three days or weeks or months. But what the dickens does that matter? Your business with the tape is now, not tomorrow. The reason can wait, but you must act instantly. Or be left. Time and again, I see this happen. You'll remember that Holler Tube went down three points the other day, while the rest of the market rallied sharply. That was the fact. 
On the following Monday, you saw that the directors passed the dividend. That was the reason. They knew what they were going to do. And even if they didn't sell the stock themselves, they at least didn't buy it. There was no inside buying. No reason why it should not break. Well, I kept out my little memorandum book, perhaps six months. Instead of leaving for home the moment I was through with my work, I jot down the figures I wanted and would study the changes, always looking for the repetitions and parallelisms of behavior learning to read the tape, although I was not aware of it at the time. One day, one of the office boys, he was older than I, came to me where I was eating my lunch and asked me on the quiet if I had any money. Why do you want to know, I said. Well, he said, I've got a dandy tip on Burlington. I'm going to play it if I can get somebody to go in with me. How do you mean play it? I asked. To me, the only people who played or could play tips were the customers, old jiggers with oodles of dough. Why, it cost hundreds, even thousands of dollars to get into the game. It was like owning your private carriage and having a coachman who wore a silk hat. That's what I need. Play it, he said. How much you got? How much you need? Well, I can trade in five shares by putting up five dollars. How are you going to play it? I'm going to buy all the Burlington the bucket shop will let me carry with the money I gave him from margin, he said. It's going up for sure. It's like picking up money. We'll double ours in a jiffy. Hold on, I said to him, and pulled out my little dope book. I wasn't interested in doubling my money, but in his saying that Burlington was going up. If it was, my notebook ought to show it. I looked. Sure enough, Burlington, according to my figuring, was acting as it usually did before it went up. I had never bought or sold anything in my life, and I never gambled with the other boys. But all I could see was that this was a grand chance to test the accuracy of my work, of my hobby. It struck me at once that if my dope didn't work in practice, there was nothing in the theory of it to interest anybody. So I gave him all I had, and with our pooled resources, he went to one of the nearby bucket shops and bought some Burlington. Two days later, we cashed in. I made a profit of $3.12. After that first trade, I got to speculating on my own hook in the bucket shops. I'd go during my lunch hour and buy or sell. It never made any difference to me. I was playing a system, not a favorite stock or backing opinions. All I knew was the arithmetic of it. As a matter of fact, mine was the ideal way to operate in a bucket shop where all that trader does is to bet on fluctuations as they're printed by the ticker on the tape. It was not long before I was taking much more money out of the bucket shops than I was pulling down from my job in the brokerage office. So I gave up my position. My folks objected, but they couldn't say much when they saw what I was making. I was only a kid, and office boy wages were not very high. I did mighty well on my own hook. I was 15 when I had my first thousand and laid the cash in front of my mother, all made in the bucket shops in a few months, besides when I had taken it home. My mother carried on something awful. She wanted me to put it away in a savings bank out of reach of temptation. She said it was more money than she had ever heard any boy of 15 had made, starting with nothing. She didn't quite believe it was real money. She used to worry and fret about it, but I didn't think of anything except that I could keep on proving my figuring was right. That's all the fun there is, being right by using your head. If I was right when I tested my convictions with 10 shares, I would be 10 times more right if I traded in 100 shares. That is all that having more margin meant to me. I was right more emphatically. Or courage? No, no difference. If all I have is $10 and I risk it, I am much braver than when I risk a million if I have another million salted away. Anyhow, at 15, I was making a good living out of the stock market. I began in the smaller market shops, where the man who traded in 20 shares at a clip was suspected of being John W. Gates in disguise, or J.P. Morgan traveling incognito. Bucket shops in those days seldom laid down on their customers. They didn't have to. There were other ways of parting customers from their money. Even when they guessed right, the business was tremendously profitable. When it was conducted legitimately, I mean straight as far as the bucket shop went, 
the fluctuations took care of the shoestrings. It doesn't take much of a reaction to wipe out a margin of only three quarters of a point. Also, no Welsher could ever get back in the game. Wouldn't have any trade. I didn't have a following. I kept my business to myself. There was a one-man business, anyhow. It was my head, wasn't it? Prices either were going the way I doped them out, without any help from friends or partners, or they were going the other way, and nobody could stop them out of kindness to me. I couldn't see where I needed to tell my business to anybody else. I've got friends, of course, but my business has always been the same. A one-man affair. That's why I've always played a low in hand. As it was, it didn't take long for the bucket shots to get sore on me for beating them. I'd walk in and plank down my margin, but they'd look at it without making a move to grab it. They'd tell me there was nothing to it. That was the time they got to calling me the boy plunger. I had to be changing brokers all the time, going from one bucket shop to another. It got so that I had to give a fictitious name. I begin light, only 15 or 20 shares. At times, when they got suspicious, I'd lose on purpose at first, and then sting them proper. Of course, after a little while, they'd find me too expensive, and they'd tell me to take myself and my business elsewhere, and not interfere with the owner's dividends. Once, when the big concern I'd been trading with for months shut down on me, I made up my mind to take a little more of their money away from them. That bucket shop had branches all over the city, and hotel lobbies, and in nearby towns, I went to one of the hotel branches and asked the manager a few questions, and finally got to trading. But as soon as I played an active stock my special way, he began to get messages from the head office asking him who it was that was operating. The manager told me what they asked him, and I told him my name was Edward Robinson of Cambridge. He telephoned the glad news to the big chief, but the other end wanted to know what I looked like. When the manager told me that, I said to him, Told on a short, fat man with dark hair and a bushy beard. But he described me instead, and then he listened, and his face got red, and he hung up and told me to beat it. What did they say to you? I asked him politely. They said, you blankety blank fool, didn't we tell you to take no business from Larry Livingston? And you deliberately let him trim us out of seven hundred dollars. He didn't say what else they told him. I tried the other branches one after another, but they all got to know me and my money wasn't any good in any of their offices. I couldn't even go in to look at the quotations without some of the clerks making cracks at me. I tried to get them to let me trade at long intervals by dividing my visits among them all, but that didn't work. Finally, there was only one left me, and that was the biggest and richest of all, the Cosmopolitan Stock Brokerage Company. The Cosmopolitan was rated as A1 and did an enormous business. It had branches in every manufacturing town in New England. They took my trading all right, and I bought and sold stocks and made and lost money for months. But in the end, it happened with them as usual. They didn't refuse my business point blank, as the small concerns had. Oh, not because it wasn't sportsmanship, but because they knew it would give them a black eye to publish the news that they wouldn't take a fellow's business, just because that fellow happened to make a little money. But they did the next worst thing. That is, they made me put up a three-point margin and compelled me to pay a premium, at first, of a half a point, then a point, and finally a point and a half. Some handicapped that. How? Easy. Suppose steel was selling at 90 and you bought it. Your ticket read normally, bought 10 steel at 90 and one eight. If you put up a point margin, it meant that if you broke 89 and a quarter, you were wiped out automatically. In a bucket shop, the customer is not importuned for more margin, or put to the painful necessity of telling his broker to sell for anything he can get. But when the Cosmopolitan tacked on that premium, they were hitting below the belt. It meant that if the price was 90 when I bought, instead of making my ticket bought steel at 90 and an eighth, it read bought steel at 91 and an eighth. Why that stock could advance a point and a quarter after I bought it, and I'd still be losing money if I closed the trade. And by also insisting that I put up a three-point margin at the very start, they reduced my trading capacity by two-thirds. So that was the only bucket shop that would take my business at all, and I had to accept their terms or quit trading. Of course, I had my ups and downs, but was a winner on balance. However, the cosmopolitan people were not satisfied with the awful handicap they attacked on me, which should have been enough to beat anybody. They tried to double-cross me. They didn't get me. 
I escaped because of one of my hunches. The Cosmopolitan, as I said, was my last resort. It was the richest bucket shop in New England. And as a rule, they put no limit on a trade. I think I was the heaviest individual trader they had, that is, of the steady everyday customers. They had a fine office and the largest and completest flotation board I have ever seen anywhere. They ran along the whole length of the big room and every imaginable thing was quoted. I mean, stocks dealt in on the New York and Boston stock exchanges. Cotton, wheat, provisions, metals, everything that was bought and sold in New York, Chicago, Boston, and Liverpool. You know how they traded in bucket shops? You gave your money to a clerk and told him what you wished to buy or sell. He looked at the tape or the quotation board and took the price from there. The last one, of course. He also put down the time on the ticket, so that it almost read like a regular broker's report. That is, that they had bought or sold for you so many shares of such a stock, at such a price, at such a time, on such a day, and how much money they received from you. When you wished to close your trade, you went to the clerk, the same or another. It depended on the shop, and you told him. He took the last price, and if the stock had not been active, he waited for the next quotation that came out on the tape. He wrote that price and the time on your ticket, okayed it, and gave it back to you. And then you went to the cashier and got whatever cash it called for. Of course, when the market went against you and the price went beyond the limit set by your margin, your trade automatically closed itself, and your ticket became one more scrap of paper. In the humbler bucket shops, where people were allowed to trade in as little as five shares, the tickets were little slips, different colors for buying and selling, and at times, as for instance in boiling bull markets, the shots would be hard hit because all the customers who were bulls and happened to be right. Then the bucket shop would deduct both buying and selling commissions, and if you bought a stock at 20, the ticket would read 20 and a quarter. You thus had only three quarters of a point's run for your money. But the Cosmopolitan was the finest in New England. It had thousands of patrons, and I really think I was the only man they were afraid of. Neither the killing premium nor the three-point margin they made me put up reduced by trading much. I kept on buying and selling as much as they'd let me. I sometimes had a line of 5,000 shares. Well, on the day the thing happened that I'm going to tell you, I was short 3,500 shares of sugar. I had seven big pink tickets for 500 shares each. The Cosmopolitan used big slips with a blank space on them where they could write down additional margin. Of course, the bucket shops never asked for more margin. The thinner the shoestring, the better for them, for their profit lies and you're being wiped. In the smaller shops, if you wanted to manage your trade still further, they'd make out a new ticket. So they could charge you the buying commission and only give you a run of three quarters of a point on each point's decline. For they figured the selling commission also exactly as if it were a new trade. Well, this day, I remember I had up over $10,000 in margins. I was only 20 when I first accumulated $10,000 in cash. And you ought to have heard my mother. You'd have thought that $10,000 in cash was more than anybody carried around except old John D. And she used to tell me to be satisfied and go into some regular business. I had a hard time convincing her that I was not gambling, but making money by figure. But all she could see was that $10,000 was a lot of money, and all I could see was more margin. I had put out my 3,509 shares of sugar at 105 and a quarter. There was another fellow in the room, Henry Williams, who was short 2,500 shares. I used to sit by the ticker and call out the quotations for the board board. The price behaved as I thought it would. It promptly went down a couple of points and paused a little to get its breath before taking another dip. The general market was pretty soft, and everything looked promising. Then, all of a sudden, I didn't like the way sugar was doing its hesitating. I began to feel uncomfortable. I thought I ought to get out of the market. Then it sold for 103. That was the low for the day. But instead of feeling more confident, I felt more uncertain. I knew something was wrong somewhere, but I couldn't spot it exactly. But if something was coming and I didn't know where from, I couldn't be on my guard against it. That being the case, I'd better be out of the market. You know, I don't do things blindly. I don't like to. I never did. Even as a kid, I had to know why I should do certain things. But this time, I had no definite reason to give to myself.
and yet I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't stand it. I called to a fellow I knew, Dave Wyman, and said to him, Dave, you can take my place here. I want you to do something for me. Wait a little before you call out the next price of sugar, will you? He said he would, and I got up and gave him my place by the ticker so he could call out the prices for the boring. I took my seven sugar tickets out of my pocket and walked over to the counter, to where the clerk was who marked the tickets when you closed your trades. But I didn't really know why I should get out of the market, so I just stood there, leaning against the counter, my tickets in my hand so that the clerk couldn't see them. Pretty soon, I heard the clicking of a telegraph instrument, and I saw Tom Burnham, the clerk, turn his head quickly and listen. Then, I felt that something crooked was hatching and I decided not to wait any longer. Just then, Dave Wyman by the ticker began, shh, and quick as a flash, I slapped my tickets on the counter in front of the clerk and yelled, close sugar, before Dave had finished calling the price. So, of course, the house had to close my sugar at the last quotation. What Dave called turned out to be 103 again. According to my dope, sugar should have broken 103 by now. The engine wasn't hitting right. I had a feeling that there was a trap in the neighborhood. At all events, the telegraph instrument was now going like mad, and I noticed that Tom Burnham, the clerk, had left my tickets unmarked where I laid them, and was listening to the clicking as if he were waiting for something. So I yelled at him, Hey Tom, what the hell are you waiting for? Mark the price on these tickets 103. Get it paid off. Everybody in the room heard me, and began to look toward us and ask what was the trouble. For, you see, while the Cosmopolitan had never laid down, there was no telling. And a run on a bucket shop can start like a run on a bank. If one customer gets suspicious, the others follow suit. So Tom looked sulky, but came over and marked my tickets closed at 103, and shoved the seven of them over toward me. He sure had a sour face. Say, the distance from Tom's place to the cashier's cage wasn't over eight feet. But I hadn't got to the cashier to get my money when Dave Wyman by the ticker yelled excitedly, Gosh, sugar, 108. But it was too late. So I just laughed and called over to Tom. It didn't work that time, did it, old boy? Of course, it was a put-up job. Henry Williams and I together were short 6,000 shares of sugar. That bucket shop had my margin and Henry's. And there may have been a lot of other sugar shorts in the office possibly eight or 10,000 shares in all. Suppose they had $20,000 in sugar margins. That was enough to pay the shop to thimble rig the market on the New York Stock Exchange and wipe us out. In the old days, whenever a bucket shop found itself loaded with too many bulls on a certain stock, it was a common practice to get some broker to wash down the price of that particular stock far enough to wipe out all the customers that were long of it. This seldom cost the bucket shop more than a couple of points on a few hundred shares, and they made thousands of dollars. That was what the Cosmopolitan did to get me and Henry Williams and the other sugar shorts. Their brokers in New York ran up the price to 108. Of course, it fell right back, and Henry and a lot of others were wiped out. Whenever there was an unexplained sharp drop, which was followed by instant recovery, the newspapers in those days used to call it a bucket shop drive. And the funniest thing was that not later than 10 days after the Cosmopolitan people tried to double-cross me, a New York operator did the amount of over $70,000. This man, who was quite a market factor in his day, and a member of the New York Stock Exchange, made a great name for himself as a bear during the Bryan Panic of 96. He was forever running up against stock exchange rules that kept him from carrying out some of his plans at the expense of his fellow members. One day, he figured that there would be no complaints from either the exchange or the police authorities if he took from the bucket shops of the land some of their ill-gotten gains. In the instance I speak of, he sent 35 men to act as customers. They went to the main office and to the bigger branches. On a certain day at a fixed hour, the agents all bought as much of a certain stock as the managers would let them. They had instructions to sneak out at a certain profit. Of course, what he did was to distribute bull tips on that stock among his cronies, and then he went into the floor of the stock exchange and bid up the price, helped by the room traders, who thought he was a good sport being careful to pick out the right stock for that work. There was no trouble in putting up the price three or four points. 
His agents at the bucket shops cashed in as prearranged. A fellow told me the originator cleaned up $70,000 net, and his agents made their expenses and then paid besides. He played that game several times all over the country, punishing the bigger bucket shops of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. One of his favorite stocks was Western Union, because it was so easy to move a semi-active stock like that a few points up and down. His agents bought it at a certain figure. Sold at two points profit, went short and took three points more. By the way, I read the other day that the man died poor and obscure. If he had died in 1896, you would have got at least a column on the first page of every New York paper. As it was, he got two lines on the fifth.